Hey all you sub freaks and welcome back to Tronic 7. We are back in NS car, the 2006 sub 9 for Vector in Fusion Blue. And I just came back from the inspection station with this car and she passed with flying colors. But this car has really had a tough summer and let me tell you about the clutch failure that nearly killed this car. So right now it's in the middle of August but about six weeks ago we went on vacation. And as Anna came back from work that Friday I went out to the parking lot to meet her. There was this horrific screeching sound coming from the clutch when you engage the clutch pedal. Listen to this. Well, that's the sound you don't want to have from your clutch. So after racking my brain a bit and talking to some friends, I decided it's probably the throwout bearing. That's because there's no noise when driving normally and not using the clutch, but as soon as you touch the pedal, the screeching starts. But as you know, the Saab is a front-wheel drive car, it has a transverse mounted engine, so the gearbox is in the front of the car, and therefore also the clutch. Taking it out is quite a big operation, and way out of my league. So diagnosing the problem further than it's just something with the clutch was very difficult. So, clutches are expensive and that's mostly due to labor. You have to take the gearbox down, and to take the gearbox down you have to take the downpipe away, you have to remove the drive shafts, there's a lot of steps. I think the workshop manual has around 50 steps for removal and 50 steps to put it all back. And that's just for the gearbox. And when you have everything down, it's a very good idea to replace everything. So, we mentally prepared for the cost of replacing the pressure plate, the clutch itself, and the throwout bearing. In the Saab 95, the slave cylinder and the throwout bearing is in one unit, so we had to replace both of them too. Now, there's two mistakes you can make when replacing the Saab 95 clutch. The first one is not replacing the slave cylinder. I mean, you have everything down, you have the clutch out, why not replace the cylinder itself? Since if it breaks, you have to remove every single thing and the gearbox once again. Now, the second mistake you can make, and this is not very uncommon, is that you don't use a Saab OEM slave cylinder. It is very tempting to save a few hundred Swedish kronor to go with the aftermarket brand. But you know, it's just a few hundred kronor compared to a few thousand for the labor of removing the gearbox. But this car deserves the VIP treatment. All the components we put back in are Saab OEM, including the slave cylinder. And there's another thing. This car has the small clutch from factory, but we decided to go with the bigger clutch. The same on the Arrow and on the 2.3 liter biopower. That clutch is still a Saab OEM clutch, but it's very strong and takes a lot of torque. So I shopped around and was looking for a workshop that could do the clutch in the middle of the vacation in July. And that wasn't very easy. Many of the garages just told me flat out, it's impossible, we have such a long line waiting and half our staff is currently on holiday. And the quotes I did get were about 12, 13,000 Swedish kronor, 13, 1400 euros. Quite a lot of money for an unexpected cost. But I eventually settled for this workshop in Vänersborg that I used to replace the pistons in Luxen, my old car, the Arrow. The workshop is called Jonas Motor och Verkstad, run by a guy named Jonas Billstrup, and I can highly recommend that place. He's been doing great work to our cars. Back in 2014, he did a great work on my Arrow, that car you know as Luxen. He replaced the pistons and some internal stuff in the engine and did a good work. And just to be clear, Jonas was not the guy who replaced my timing chain. In fact, I should have gone to Jonas, but instead I cheaped out and went to some stupid home mechanic who didn't do the stuff right, and that's also what killed the car. The only drawback is that Vänersborg is a two-hour drive away from Jönköping, where we live. But we figured that since we're going on a vacation on the Swedish west coast that same day, we could take the cars with us. I was driving this car, and Anna took the Phoenix, we drive to Vänersborg, give the car away, and then go on with our vacation. And so we did, but you know, driving with a car that doesn't really have a good clutch is a bit nerve-wracking. I drove it as carefully as I could, I used the clutch as few times as possible, but it's a tricky road, it's not just a highway, put it in fifth and drive for hours, it's, it's a normal Swedish road with a lot of overtakes and speed traps and roundabouts and crossings you need to do, so you had to do a lot of acceleration, braking, stopping, starting, all these things. I think I got it under 15 to 20 uses of the clutch, and that's actually quite impressive. When coming to a stop, I just put the car in neutral and roll it down, and then for starting, I just put it in first, clutch, third, clutch, fifth. 
as quickly as I could. Every time I pushed the clutch pedal down, I thought, this is the last time. I'm not getting any power back when I release the clutch. But for some strange luck, it all held together. We came all the way to Vanishborg. We said hi to Jonas. He took the car in and he wasn't really sure about the diagnosis, but we both suspected the throat bearing. Well then, you're asking yourself, what was the actual issue with the clutch? Well, it was much worse than we had anticipated and much worse than what the mechanic thought as well. You see, when the technician separated the gearbox from the engine, a bolt fell out. A bolt that had come loose from the flywheel and had been tumbling around in the clutch area, making that metallic noise as soon as we pushed the clutch pedal down. So as you can tell, we were really, really lucky. That clutch could have killed the entire car with the gearbox and the engine. You see, if a bolt gets stuck in the springs of the clutch, it can cause the gearbox to fail and crash, it can cause the engine to cease, I mean, it's turning and it can't go around anymore. What's gonna happen? Well, something will give. And in that case, well, this car wasn't very expensive. We probably had to buy a new car and not fix the engine. That would be too expensive. So that's the weirdest clutch failure I've heard of. And same for the technician. It's been working on subs for, I think, 20 years now and I've never even seen anything like this. A bolt on the flywheel coming loose. I mean, I think I have the full service history for this car, but I've never seen that the clutch has been replaced. This car has gone about 200,000 kilometers by now and I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, this thing wouldn't happen from factory. A bolt that is loose from factory on the flywheel would fall out way earlier than 200,000 kilometers. So at some point the clutch must have been replaced, right? I'm not really sure, maybe you guys can help me think about this, but I'm not really seeing the pattern here. Well, that bolt has caused so much damage. Here's a picture of the whole clutch assembly and the slave cylinder and the throwout bearing. He told me that the clutch itself was completely gone. The pressure plate was worn out too, and the slave cylinder. I tried to move it, and I could move the whole cylinder and the bearing a few centimeters up and down and wiggle it around. But you know what? I'm happy for the car now. It's running really well. We put a new clutch in. We have the aero clutch with a new pressure plate and a new clutch assembly. And that's a no-brainer. If you're ever replacing the clutch in your Saab 95, get the bigger one. I think the difference in cost was about 500 Swedish kronor, maybe like 50-60 euros. And Jonas, the technician, and I found something quite interesting for the pricing of the clutch. I got a few quotes, as I told you, from different workshops around the area here. And they all quoted me a material cost for 5,000 kronor for the clutch assembly, the aero clutch, and the slave cylinder. Interestingly enough, the exact same parts costs about half that cost when you buy it from Maptoon. I mean, it's not a cheap aftermarket stuff, it's a Saab OEM brand. The clutch is made by Sachs, and it's the exact same part. And it costs 2,700 kroner, I think. So, just short of 300 euros for the clutch assembly. So in that case, if you go to a quote-unquote normal workshop that buys parts from the Saab parts network, then you can save a lot of money on the clutch by actually buying the clutch yourself. But remember, if you're buying stuff yourself and give it to your technician to put in the car, if something breaks, well, warranty is not going to be that easy to, to discuss, right? I mean, if you let the technician buy it, then it's on his terms. And if something fails, it's on him. But if you buy it yourself, well, you're more on your own. But that's the good thing I liked about Jonas. He bought the stuff directly from Maptoon anyway, so he could get the stuff for the good price and give warranty to me. And as it happened, that was actually the last clutch that Maptoon had in stock, so we were lucky once again. Now, the clutch wasn't the only thing we got done at the workshop. While driving to Vanisborg, I had a few more ideas that I asked Jonas to fix. For instance, a common problem with the Saab 95, starting with model year 2004. Yes, this is something that wasn't the case for the older Saabs, but if you have a 95 from 2004 or newer, then you might know that the shift lever can be quite sloppy. You might know the feeling when you're shifting gears in that car and it feels mushy, it doesn't really have distinct modes to go into. And that's actually a bushing in the shift lever linkage. It's close to the gearbox in the engine bay, and that bushing goes bad. Now I knew that since he was removing the gearbox anyway, he needed to remove the gear shift linkage. So I asked him, well, can you put in one of these upgraded cool aftermarket bushings? And he's like, sure thing, I know exactly what you mean, I get it done, it's not a big cost. So now we have the metal bushings from Maptoon. I think they're made out of brass and this car feels like a race car. It's even better than my old Arrow before. I highly recommend getting these metal shift lever bushings. I mean, 
it's an awesome thing. So shifting feels great, the clutch pedal feels great. I mean, before the clutch pedal really had to go high up before it engaged. So now you have to push it quite further down to release the clutch. It's a whole new feel in the clutch pedal, whole new feel in the shift lever, and together with a nice tight steering we have in this car, it's great to drive. And we also asked you want us to fix a common problem in the rear of the car. And I've been thinking about doing a video about the replacement for the longest time, but I never got around to do it because it's quite a bit of work. But we did replace the trailing arm bushings. And this is another common problem with the 9.5. Just in front of the rear wheel, inside here, it's the trailing arm that holds the rear suspension. And here is the sort of a knuckle, and inside the knuckle is a big rubber and metal bushing. This bushing is infamous for going bad and going bad quite early. When you're driving over a curb, we had this squeakiness in the rear. It really made noise in the entire of the car, and we realized it was just the bushing going bad. Also, the rear wheel can have a bit of a camber. It's like these uh, cool kids today with their, with their stanced wheels. But the Saab 95 often does this by itself, and it's often thanks to the big bushing inside of here. So we asked Jonas if he had time to put in the bushes as well, and he said, sure thing. And for me, this is quite a big job to replace the bushing. I know it took almost half a day for it to do it myself, on a lift even. But uh, for an experienced technician, this should be easy work. The big job is actually just to remove and press out the old bushing. When you have the Powerflex bushes, you just push them together, like I've showed in a few videos for other Powerflex bushes. And this also helped tremendously to improve the feel of the car. We no longer have the squeakiness in the rear, and of course, together with a great shift lever and the clutch, it feels like a brand new car to drive. So all in all, the repair bill wasn't too bad. We paid a grand total of 9,400 Swedish kronor, which is a bit less than a thousand euros. And then we include the labor and the materials for the clutch, including a brand new Saab OEM slave cylinder and the bigger aero clutch upgrade. That also includes the bushing for the gear shift linkage and the Powerflex bushes in the rear, including labor. So in the end, everything turned out nicely. We now have a big upgraded aero clutch, shifts like a monster and stays on the road like nothing else. And shortly after, we were able to score one of these Crossmax roof boxes. We've been looking for one of these for quite a while, but haven't found one that wasn't sold in like 10 minutes before we could buy it. This Crossmax roof box can no longer be bought new, and the used market is getting very, very intense because a lot of Saab owners want this Saab branded and really nice looking, in my opinion, roof box. Again, my old car, Luxon, that's a Salomon edition, and it actually had one of these roof boxes from a factory, but the old owner wanted to keep it, so we never had it. I mean, I remember as a kid seeing an advert for a 95 Arrow wagon in laser red with one of these roof boxes on driving on one of these curved highways up in Norway on the Alps or something. It looked amazing, and I've been wanting a car like this with that roof box ever since. And I'm thinking about making a separate review about the roof box. If you guys are interested, I can make one to talk more about the features and stuff. For instance, you see that this roof box is recessed. The roof rack goes into the box, which makes it closer to the roof and has less overall height of the vehicle. So that's basically the end of the video, with one short exception. We thought after doing the clutch work, the bushings and the roof box, this car would be grateful for us and give us a lot of maintenance and trouble-free life, right? But we bought the roof box up in Uppsala in Sweden, and I swear it took like 20-30 kilometers before we had the check engine light. <laughs> All this money is spent on everything, and yeah, well, the DI cassette started the giveaway. You know, the typical sub disease with the coil pack inside the direct ignition cassette going bad, giving the fault codes P1312 and P1334 as you can see from my app readout. Well, that was another expense, but I was able to find a good used direct ignition cassette and didn't have to pay too much for it. Thanks, Patrick, for selling me your old DI cassette. So this is what the coil pack looks like in the Saab 95. You can't replace the coils one at a time, you have to replace the whole thing. If you replace them, don't buy aftermarket cassettes. Look underneath the cassette, look for the sticker, it's supposed to say SEM, and maybe also the Saab part number. If it says something else like Pro Parts, ooh, Pro Parts, yuck, then you will have problems. Trust me, you never ever save that 20-30% on the OEM st stuff when it comes to DI cassettes. 
Then there's also the version. This says TK, which is a Swedish word for direct ignition cassette, and then 3.7. Then there's a letter B. So this version is 3.7B. It's a slightly older one, and I think that's why it failed. The new one is a 3.7C, and the current version, if you buy a new in the stores today, it will be a 3.7E. Don't get anything that says 3.6. I recommend 3.7, preferably version C or D or newer. Also, there is a hairline crack in this cassette we found out. It might be related, but not necessarily. I mean, this thing is junk, so we're probably just gonna throw it away. And yes, the DI cassette is the easiest part by far in the 95 engine to replace. This is the cassette. You remove four screws. I think they're Torx T30, then the connector, and just lift it out. Simple as that. But the problem, of course, is that this cassette is quite expensive. I think they cost like three and a half thousand Swedish kilner, like 350 euros or something. And that's, that's an actually quite expensive part, especially when you just replace the clutch. Am I right? So I guess the takeaway of this video is don't buy the aftermarket DI cassettes, don't buy the aftermarket clutch slave cylinder, buy the right parts for your car and it will reward you with many, many miles of good service. Okay, I've been rambling on too much about this summer store with the car, but as I told you in the beginning, it's just past inspection with flying colors. There's still some things to do. For instance, we have problem with the horn again and the steering wheel button. So I think that's the clock spring. Hopefully I can get a new part and replace it within a few days. Hopefully get a video up, I hope. But anyway, thanks guys for watching Trionic 7. Yes, I know I have been making fewer videos lately, but you know, this YouTube channel is a hobby of mine and sometimes work and private life gets in the way and it can be a few weeks or even months before I make new videos. But don't worry, I haven't forgot you guys. Thanks for all the support. Many people have been asking, where are you at, Jonathan? Where are the videos? And I'm really happy that people actually notice when I'm not producing videos anymore. I, th I guess that's a byproduct of having grown the channel so much lately. Again, thanks very much for watching. Hope to make new videos soon, say about this roof box, some other stuff, or maybe you have some ideas of what you want to see. Keep it up, guys, and I'll see you in the next sub video. Bye-bye.